The case you are about to see is fictional, but the jury is made up of members of the public who will assess the evidence and deliver their own verdict at the end of the programme. The case before Mr. Justice Michener today is an action for damages involving two of the world's most distinguished opera singers, whose rivalry has often made headlines in the press. The plaintiff is Cheryl Van Dam, sometimes known as the Pittsburgh Nightingale. She alleges that last October she came to England to sing in a gala performance at the London Opera House, but was prevented from appearing there by the defendant, Ethella Burns, the Australian singer known in the opera houses of Europe as La Meraviglioza, the marvellous one. Miss Van Dam is claiming damages for false imprisonment. Her counsel is Mr. Stephen Harvesty. Thereby causing her to miss an engagement which was of vital importance to her prestige as an internationally famous artist. A performance, you will recall, which was especially arranged in honour of the President of France. I will now call the plaintiff, Miss Cheryl Van Dam. What is your religion? Episcopalian. Take the Bible in your right hand and read aloud the words on this card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence that I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay. Is your name Cheryl Hope Van Dam? Yes. And do you live at... The Villa des Roses Moulin, Switzerland. That is what I consider my home, yes. I also have an apartment in New York and another in the south of France. What's your occupation? I sing. Will you tell us where you've appeared and in what roles? The Metropolitan, New York, La Scala, Milan, the London Opera House, Bayreuth, San Francisco, Buenos Aires. Hmm? I've sung in Neris and Aida, Carmen, Brangaina, the Princess Aboli. Are those what might be called leading parts? Yes, all leading parts in the mezzo-soprano repertoire. Yes. Uh, on the 20th of October last year, did you have an engagement to sing in London? Yes, to appear as Carmen in a special Sunday evening performance at the London Opera House. At first, the idea didn't appeal to me too much because I was due to sing Amneris the previous night in Frankfurt. Mm. I don't like to sing on two nights running, especially when traveling's involved, but I felt I really had to. Why? I was very honored by the invitation. And also, the administrator of the Opera House, Sir Gerald Pegler, is a very dear personal friend of mine. Mm -hmm. He said there was no one else in the same league available right then, and begged me to come to London on the first plane out. Was a fee mentioned? Twelve thousand dollars. And that's about five thousand pounds. Oh, you'll have to forgive me. I'm so dumb with figures. Ha! <laughs> was this twelve thousand dollars for the performance only, or was anything else expected of you? Pardon me? Were you expected, for example, to rehearse? A full-scale rehearsal wasn't necessary. I'd already appeared in this particular production the previous season, and, of course, they had all my personal costumes in the wardrobe. During that previous season, had anyone else sung the role of Carmen? Yeah, she had a couple of times. Madame Burns. Is that the defendant, Miss Othella Burns? Uh-huh. La Meravigliosa, according to the press. Now, to return to this question of rehearsal, Weren't you expected to rehearse uh, the moves, the dramatic action? Yes, we'd agreed there'd be a kind of walkthrough in the afternoon, just to make sure we didn't bump into one another. And at what time was this walkthrough to be? Three o'clock. And did you agree to take part in the walkthrough as part of your contractual obligation to Sir Gerald? Well, I guess so. Only I never got to see the contract. It was going to be waiting for me when I arrived in London. But did you understand the verbal agreement between yourself and the administrator to be binding? Sure. Sir Gerald is a gentleman. Was there subsequently a written contract? No. Why was that? Because by the time I got to London, La Meravigliosa had deliberately loused it up. A lying cow. Did you wish to say something, Miss Burns? You will, of course, have an opportunity to put forward your version in due course. And you, Miss Van Damme, you really must try not to express 
your view of what may have happened. That's a matter for the jury. Yeah. Yeah, now, Miss Van Damme, will you please describe the flight to London? I left Frankfurt shortly before 10 a.m. On Sunday, the 20th of October, 1974. Yes, with my secretary, Mr. Frank Harlands. We were in the first-class cabin trying to arrange a drink before takeoff when she came in. Who? Madame Burns. I didn't even know she was in Frankfurt, but she'd apparently gone across, especially to catch my performance in Aida. You'll hear my version of that in due course, too. How do you know that she'd seen you in Aida? She told me. What did she say? She said, a wonderful darling, but a little flat. Was that in the tone of a friendly remark or not? It was not. But you get used to that kind of stuff from her. She picks fights with everybody on principle. We call her the boxing kangaroo. <laughs> um, now, this flight from Frankfurt, did it proceed according to schedule? No. After about an hour, there was an announcement that there was bad fog at London Airport and the plane was being diverted to this place called Fulchester. What was your reaction on hearing that? I was really mad. I didn't see how I was, was going to make it to the Opera House on time. I mean, for all I knew, it could have taken all day to get to London from this Fulchester and I was due at the walkthrough at three o'clock. Did you make any inquiries about that? I certainly did. I went straight through to the front end looking for the captain. Now, when you went forward to the front end, did you take your passport with you? No. I left my bag on the seat. My passport was in it. Yes. And where was your secretary, Mr. Hollins, at this point? Oh, he got up and followed me, saying the pilot had more important things to think about. He never was any use in an emergency. Did you, in fact, speak to any of the crew? Yes. The steward stopped me in the galley. He wouldn't let me through. And while this was all going on, where was the defendant, Miss Othella Burns? She stayed right where she was, with my bag on the seat beside her. When did you next see your passport? I didn't see it again. Not ever. The one I use now is a substitute issued by the United States Embassy in London. How did you obtain that second passport? I said the first one had been stolen. What happened when you arrived in Fulchester? Well, first we had to go through the immigration desk. There were two of them, one for British and the other for everybody else. Frank and Othello went through the British side and I lined up with the Germans. Then, of course, when it was my turn to show my passport, I couldn't find it. When did you last seen it? In the departure lounge at Frankfurt. My secretary handed it to me after he'd done the check-in and everything. Yes, yes, carry on. Well, naturally, I looked everywhere it might have gotten to, and this took quite a while because I had a load of junk with me, including a mink coat, so by the time I'd gone through the pockets and all my hand luggage, the people standing behind me weren't any too happy with the situation. The immigration officer, what was his attitude? He practically threatened to put me on the next plane out of the country. Either that or keep me in Fulchester forever, so I said, look, yes, I've Mr. come Harvesty, here... Do we need to know what the plaintiff said to the immigration officer or vice versa? Can't we confine ourselves to what happened to this lady? The what Jennifer. happened to this lady was they put me in the VIP lounge while they looked around the airplane to see if they could find my passport. VIP lounge was more like an outside privy. <laughs> what had happened to your friends? What friends? Your secretary and Miss Burns. I don't know what our burns had got to, but Frank was still there bleeding away and being useless. Well, I was really mad by now, so I yelled at him that if he wanted to get a, keep his job, he'd better go get a phone and get a hold of the Opera House or the Ambassador or someone. W weren't you more specific? Yeah, I called him a no-good slob. No, I mean about whom he was to call. <sighs> yes, I told him to get a hold of Sir Gerald and tell him what had happened. What was his reply? He said he would right away. To the best of your knowledge, was that phone call made? No, it was not. How long were you kept in the VIP lounge, Miss Mandel? About an hour, I guess. And what eventually secured your release? Well, this immigration guy must have called the embassy or somewhere, because he suddenly came back and said it was OK, I could go. So I said, great, now how do I get to London? And it turned out there still weren't any planes on account of the fog, but mm. there was a train in about 20 minutes, and if I hurried, I could make it. Yes. Do you recall the departure time of this train, Miss Van Damme? Yes, it was 12.27 out of Fulchester, but it was late. Mm. And I wasn't on it. No, well, we'll come to the reasons for that presently. I just want the jury to be quite clear about why you were detained at the airport. I told you, I couldn't find my passport. 
What, in your opinion, had happened to your passport? Oh, oh really, my lord, her opinion is of no weight and is quite inadmissible. Yes, Mr. Harvesty, we really In can't my have opinion, Miss Burns had taken it. And I've already told you, Miss Van Damme, you must not give us your beliefs and opinions. But it's the truth. Yes, in the but... first place, there was no one else could have done it. Othello was the only person who had any interest in preventing me reaching London. She was determined to stop me singing in that gala, and that was only her first attempt. It was a cute idea. But it didn't work. Yes, no, no. do let's get on to something else. What happened when you left the airport? I got a taxi and told the driver to take me to Fulchester Railroad Station. And when you arrived there? I bought a ticket for London and asked about the train. It wasn't in yet, so I figured I had time to go to the John. Ah, oh, forgive me, Miss Van Damme, but I, I think it may be that not everyone will understand what you mean by that expression. They won't? Oh, I think I'm right in saying, Mr. Harvesty, that the English equivalent would be ladies' lavatory. I'm greatly obliged, my lord. But a lavatory's where you wash. Uh, that, no doubt, is one of its functions, but perhaps not the primary one. All right, I get it. Like, we call it a restroom, but you wouldn't want to rest there. Yes, quite. Not this one, certainly. When you went into this, this place, was anyone else there? Yeah, a fella. What was she doing? Fixing up her face. Did you have any conversation with her? I may have said hi or something. I was pretty busy looking for some place to go. Well, was there some problem of choice? I'll say there was. There were four of these things in the row, and every last one of them had every something wrong with it. I mean, either there was somebody in there, or the seat was busted, or the <laughs> system was hanging off. I finally found one that was even a possibility, and this attendant appeared from nowhere. Ah, now, was that Mrs. Bullitt? Well, I wasn't exactly on social terms at that point in time. Now, do you see her in this court? Yeah, that's her over there. Did this lady say anything to you? She said the lock was out of order. I said that was the least of my worries and went in. Did the door open inwards or outwards? Towards the seat. Inwards. Did you bolt the door? I didn't even shut it. Not completely. What happened next? Pardon me? To the door, I mean. All of a sudden, it slammed shut. Could it have done so of its own accord? No way. Only if it had a bit of help. Help? Like from a fella, giving it a good hard pull. Yes, I take it, Mr. Harvesty, that this is the incident on which you base your allegation of false imprisonment. That's correct, my yeah, lord. You're not relying on the detention at the airport. Uh, no, my lord. Oh, you'd have been in some difficulty there, eh? Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, at all events, the immigration officer is an innocent agent. Indeed he is, yes. my lord. Yes, well, let's get back to the John. What did you do, Miss Van Damme, when the door slammed shut? Well, it took me a while to realize the position I was in. I mean, it wasn't until I tried to get out of there that I realized I couldn't. By this time, I could hear the train coming in, so I commenced beating on the door and hollering. Did anyone answer your appeal? Yes, Mrs. Bullet tried to open it from the outside, but it was stuck fast. She went off to get help, and after about ten minutes, they got me out of there. When you were released, was the train still standing at the platform? It certainly was not. And furthermore, there wasn't another one for several hours. How did you complete your journey then? I hired a car and told the driver to take me to London as fast as possible. I figured I'd probably miss the walkthrough, but there was an even chance I'd make it for the performance. And of course, I imagined that Frank had called the Opera House and told Sir Gerald about the trouble with the passport. What time did you arrive in London? Around seven o'clock, I guess. There was still a lot of fog about and the driver got lost a couple of times. But we went straight to the opera house. This was about an hour before the gala was due to start. Whom did you see there? I went straight to Sir Gerald and told him what had happened. He said he'd been going crazy all day trying to find out where I was because Frank hadn't called him like he said he would. And in the middle of all this, a fellow had walked in and offered to take over. At that stage, were you still prepared to honour your agreement, your verbal contract? You bet I was. You considered yourself quite capable of singing the role of Carmen, in spite of all that had gone before. Well, it was hardly the preparation I would choose, having my passport stolen and being locked in the john. Mm -hmm. I doubt whether I'd have given one of the great interpretations of all time. Anyway, there was no question of it. Why was that? Because it was already fixed that my good friend Madame Burns was going to sing the part. What was your reaction on hearing that? I hit the ceiling. But Sir Gerald wouldn't reverse his decision. No. Did you speak to Miss Burns at all? <laughs> Not a chance. I tried to, of course, but she sent word she was resting. 
in the number one dressing room, of course. So what did you do then? I didn't stay for the performance, if that's what you mean. Although Sir Gerald offered me a seat in his box, I decided to check into a hotel and watch television. Thank you, Miss Van Damme. Miss Van Damme, would it uh, be fair to say that as far as mezzo-sopranos are concerned, you are one of the top half dozen in the world? I guess so, yes. And uh, the defendant, Miss Burns, is also in that class. I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. Well, your fees for a performance are roughly comparable, are they not? I have no idea what she gets. Yes, well, there'll be evidence as to that later. But you get $12,000 for one performance. Yes. Might the loss of $12,000 cause you something of a, a pang? Sure particularly if it was stolen from me by some low-down trick. I suppose one of the reasons for your concern for money is the fact that a prima donna's professional life is a comparatively short one. Right. How long would you say? How many years at the top? Around 10 to 15, I guess. And after that, the vocal powers, they begin to fade. Depends on a person's constitution. Are you entirely happy with your performance? On that Saturday night as Amneris in Aida? I'm never entirely happy with my performance. I'm a perfectionist. Well, the German audience weren't entirely happy with your performance either, were they? They booed you, didn't they? German audiences don't boo. They whistle. That's what happened on this occasion, was it? I really don't remember. If they did, someone most likely paid them to. Yes, well, after a bad reception from the German audience, you must have been somewhat apprehensive about uh, going to London to sing again. I've told you, that's all news to me. In any event, I had an agreement with Sir Gerald. I wouldn't have gone back on that in any circumstances. Particularly not if it meant losing $12,000. You must have wished there was some way of getting hold of the money without actually having to appear on the stage of the London Opera House and perhaps further damaging your reputation. Like how, for instance? By bringing an action like this against a totally innocent woman. If she's innocent, how come she stole my passport? Did you see her steal your passport? There was no one else could have done it. It was in my bag. Are you sure you didn't take it out yourself? Why would I do that? An announcement had just been made that there was fog in London and your plane would be diverted. Instead of arriving punctually at London Airport and being met with a limousine, you were faced with the prospect of further travelling. Arriving at the Opera House, late and tired, and with your voice no doubt further affected by the fog. It's a great scenario. What did I do with the passport? You weren't searched at Fulchester Airport, were you? It's about the only thing that didn't happen to me. What are you saying? I'm questioning your claim that your passport was ever stolen. Right, I get it. First I steal my own passport, then I lock myself in the john. My, you certainly have a vivid imagination. Which would you say was easier, Miss Van Dam? To lock a toilet door from the inside or from the outside? Listen, she knew it was busted and she pulled it shut. Did you see Miss Burns pull the door shut? What do you think I was doing, looking through the keyhole? Who else had any interest in preventing me re reach that train? You had, if you decided not to sing that night. Are you crazy? There could have been six more trains that would get me there on time. Had you asked about that when you bought your ticket? No, I had not. All I asked was if the 12.27 was in. I didn't request a full breakdown of the timetable. I'll bet she had, though. I'll bet she had the whole thing figured out. She and my dear, devoted secretary between them. La meravigliosa. Ha! What is your religion? Church of England. Take the Bible in your right hand and read aloud the words on this card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Is your name Elsie Maud Bullitt? Yes, that's right. Do you live at 13 Crossman Buildings, Fulchester? Yes. What is your occupation? I work for British Rail. In what capacity? As an attendant in the ladies' convenience. 
on Sunday, the 20th of October last year. Were you on duty? Yes, I was. And I'd like to say it wasn't anything to do with me that that lady got locked in. Mm, no one suggested. I've Mrs. been working with the BI for 15 years and there's never been complaints, no. not one word. We, we were just hoping that you could tell us how this unhappy incident came about. Well, it wouldn't have done if I'd been there, but you see, I've been sent off to look for a tail. Ye yes, we're, we're going to come to that matter presently. Can you tell us when you first saw the defendant in this case, Miss Othella Burns? Which one is she? Well, there were only two ladies involved in this incident. Which one came in first? Her, sitting over there. The Cockney one. Now, Miss Burns happens to be Australian and a person of great distinction. Oh, then she ought to have known better. When she came into the ladies' lavatory, did you have any conversation with her? She passed some very unnecessary remarks about the state of cleanliness. Were these criticisms justified? Well, I, I can't say the maintenance is all it should be, no. I, I've been complaining about that lot for months. But, but apart from that, everything is in reasonable condition. Well, I don't know what they're used to in Australia. Did Miss Burns make use of the facilities? Yes, she, she washed her hands. And even that she complained about. First, there was no soap in the hotel. I can't leave soap lying about because they steal it. So I went into my little cubby hole round the corner. Ah, excuse me, Miss. In there, could you see the rest of the convenience? No, it's just a sort of cupboard where I make my tea. Mm, I see. Well, I, I found the soap and I came back with it. Mm. And there was this black lady who just come in. Oh, of course I. Didn't know she was a celebrity, not then. But I could see she wasn't a vandal or anything because she was carrying a mink coat. And what was this lady doing? Well, she was looking in the cubicles. How many are there? Four. Did she settle for anyone in particular? Yes, the second one from the left. So I thought I'd better warn her. I said, do be careful with the lock on that one, dear. It doesn't work. Is that all that you said? No, I, I said it might be dead better if she didn't shut the door. Because in the condition it was in, it sometimes got stuck. Mr Harvester, the, uh, the witness said that Miss Van Dam was looking in the cubicles. Yes, that's so, my lord. Well, then presumably the doors were open. Y yes, yes. Oh, oh, except for the ones that were occupied. No, no I, I tell a lie, sir, there was only one. Uh, uh, but presumably... If the cubicles were vacant, then the doors normally would be shut. Well, I mean, in my experience, one has no opportunity to inspect the facilities until one is inside, by which time one, of course, has parted with a coin. Perhaps you could enlighten us, Mrs. Bullitt. Were these locks operated by the insertion of a penny? Well, they used to be, my uh, law, but that was before the decibels oh, came in. Yeah, but, but there was a lot of talk about conversion, but they never got round to it. Uh, you see, uh, the whole place is due for demolition, and uh, I, I can't say I'm surprised. What is the arrangement now? Well, they can still be bolted from the inside, of uh, course. But you see, the penny in the slot's been put out of action. Ah. Or at least it's meant to be. Mm. But you see, sometimes it goes wrong, particularly the second on the left. Yes. But that, that's why I warned the lady. Yes. Nevertheless, she went into the cubicle. Yes, but she left the door slightly open like I told her to. When you gave this warning to Miss Van Dam, was Miss Burns within earshot? Well, she was at the base and it, it's only a few feet away. I'm sure she heard. Mm. I handed her the uh, soap how, how and many, she... How many feet away? Well, I should she... think about four or five. Yes, <coughs> yes, I see. Carry on. Well, I gave her the soap and she said, where's the bloody towel? So I had to go back into my cubicle and while I was there, I heard the most terrific bang. By what was that caused? The door. Well, the, the door with this defective lock? Yes, that's right. Where was Miss Burns standing when you... For the towel. Well, she was at the basin. And when you came out from your cubby hole? Well, when I came back, she was in the middle near the cubicles. She, she sort of snatched the towel out of my hands, wiped her hands, and went there. Without so much as a word of thanks, let alone a tip. How soon after you heard the bang of the door did you come out from your cubby hole? Straight away. I just went for the towel. Split second. Yes, that's right. What happened after that? 
Well, the, the train captain. What about Miss Van Damme? Oh, I didn't realise she was locked in at first. I heard the cistern flushing. And I must say, I thought she'd better get a move on if she wanted to catch that London train. And of course, she started trying to get it and she couldn't. How did you know that she couldn't? Oh, she let out a really dreadful scream and started using bad language through the door. Uh, did you attempt to release her? Yes, I, I turned the handle, but that just seemed to make it worse. That The lock was definitely stuck. Mm. We had the same trouble once before when some foreigner put in a coin and it all had to be unscrewed. Really? Really? Now, how long did all this take, your attempts to release Miss Van Damme? Oh, several minutes. She kept on yelling and banging against the door. I, I, I said, it's no good, dear. I'll have to go and get the maintenance. To whom were you referring? Mr Watson. He's in charge of that. Mm. I don't want to cast aspersions, but he did take his time. Of course, by the time he'd unscrewed the lot and let Lady out, the train had gone. Yes. Thank you, Mrs. Bullitt. Oh, thank you, sir. Mrs. Bullitt, do your qualifications for the post of lavatory attendant include any expert knowledge as a locksmith? Great, pal. You're not a mechanic, are you? Oh, no, I'll leave all that side to Mr. Watson. Then how do you know that the lock did jam? It stands to reason. The door wouldn't open. What else could have stopped it? Well, you said yourself it was a bolt on the interior. The lady would hardly have locked herself in, would she? Oh, she should have heard her yelling blue murder. Yes. The lady is famous for her dramatic powers. I definitely heard that bang. Someone slammed the door. It could have been a push from it the inside. It could have been, but I don't think it was. In fact, I'm absolutely certain it was her. Did you actually see Miss Burns pulling the door shut? No. Then what possible right have you to come here and make accusations against a perfectly innocent and indeed distinguished woman? Well, in my job, you have to keep your eyes open all the time. You, you, you'd be surprised at some of the things they get up to. <laughs> and if they've done it is wrong, I, I can always tell I can. Particularly, I suppose, if they don't leave you a tip. Have you any more questions for the witness, Mr. Harvester? No, no further questions, my lord. Thank you, Mrs. Bullitt. You may leave the witness box. I call Sir Gerald Pegler. And the two ladies in this action are, of course, known to you. Extremely well. And I should like to make it clear that though I have been called as a witness for Miss Van Damme, I look on myself as being quite independent. My regard for Miss Burns is in no way diminished. I'm sure everyone appreciates your position, Sir Gerald. You've worked with both ladies in the past, and no doubt you hope to do so in the future. Quite so. You cannot, of course, help us with regard to the events at Fulchester. No. Were you responsible for organising this gala performance on the 20th of October? Yes, I was asked to do so by the Foreign Office. The French President was coming to London on a private visit at rather short notice, and someone had decided that this would be an appropriate entertainment for him. Was the choice of the opera left to you? Well, there was really very little choice. Plainly, it had to be by a French composer, and our production of Carmen was the only French opera in the repertory. And had Miss Van Damme and Miss Burns both appeared in this particular production? Yes, they had, during the previous season. With equal success? I think it would be very rash of me to express a preference. And how could one anyway? They are both so completely different. Mm. It would be like choosing between Dickens and Dostoevsky, emeralds and sapphires, a camembert and stilton, both excellent but not be com to be compared with one another. No, no, but all the same, since you could only choose one of them. I didn't know really where Miss Burns was. I knew Miss Van Damme was at the Metropolitan, so I telephoned her there. Yes. What did you say? I asked her if she would come to London and do a quick Carmen for a rather undemanding audience. I suppose that was rather wicked of me, but the diplomatic corps isn't really very musical, and mm. I wanted to make it sound as easy as I could. And did Miss Van Damme agree to come? After a little further persuasion, yes. It wasn't extremely convenient for her, as she was due to sing the previous night at Frankfurt. Was a fee mentioned at this stage? Her usual fee of $12,000 and travelling expenses for herself and her secretary, Mr. Hollands. Were any conditions attached to the agreement? Only that she should get to London in time for the walkthrough. Did this walkthrough proceed as planned? No, it certainly did not. 
It was scheduled for three o'clock, and half an hour later, there was still no sign of Miss Van Damme. Did you receive any explanation of her non-appearance? None at all. In particular, did you receive a telephone call from Mr. Hollins? No. Did you leave the opera house at all that day? Did you go for lunch, for example? No, it was a day of crisis. I had some sandwiches sent in. What steps were taken to find out what had happened to Miss Van Damme? Uh, someone had heard about the fog on the midday news, aeroplanes being diverted and so on. I had no idea which flight Miss Van Damme was on, so I telephoned a colleague in Frankfurt to see whether he knew. And a colleague at the Opera House there? Yes, he said that weather conditions there were perfectly clear, and presumably she was on the morning flight. What further steps did you take, Sir Gerald? We found out that the plane had been diverted to Fulchester. I was extremely worried. It looked as if Miss Van Damme was not going to make the walkthrough. So what did you decide? That we should start without her. But at this stage, did you still believe that she would arrive in time for the performance? Oh, yes, of course. Did you consider that Miss Van Damme was in breach of contract by failing to appear for the walkthrough? Certainly not. Obviously, it was through no fault of her own. No. What happened then? I had a telephone call from Estella Burns. Mm -hmm. She told me that she'd been on the plane from Frankfurt with Miss Van Damme, who was having some trouble with her immigration documents. She'd been delayed and might not reach London for several hours. Did she say where she'd last seen Miss Van Damme? I don't think so, but it was only a very brief telephone call. She came to the point, which was very characteristic of her, and said she was jumping straight into a cab and coming to help me out. I presume she was speaking from a London flat. It was only a few minutes later that she arrived at the Opera House and went straight on stage to take over the leading role in the walkthrough. Do you have any further news of Miss Van Damme? We heard she'd been allowed to leave the airport, even though she couldn't find her passport, but I didn't know precisely where she was. Did not Miss Burns enlighten you? I think we both thought that Cheryl would turn up somehow. But, of course, by the end of the walkthrough... Ah, now, excuse me, Sir Gerald, what time was that? I suppose about 6.30. By that time, the situation was beginning to look very serious. There was a possibility that the performance would have to be cancelled, and I couldn't imagine what the Foreign Office would have had to say to that. So what did you decide? To find a substitute, and, of course, one was already available in the shape of Madame Burns. She knew the role already, and we had our costumes from last season in the wardrobe. So that was the obvious solution, the only one, in fact. Who actually proposed it? She did. She said, Jerry, you know I'm as strong as an ox and I can do Carmen standing on my head. I must say I was extremely grateful. Was there any mention of a fee? She said she would do it for whatever I was paying Miss Van Damme. When did you see Miss Van Damme? Uh, about half an hour later, she arrived at the Opera House in a tremendous temper and I must say was very tiresome. I told her it was far too late to alter things, but she was in a very excited state and started to accuse me of all kinds of plots. How did you take these accusations? I'm afraid I was rather rude to her. I said she had a persecution mania and mustn't go around saying that Othella and I had arranged the fog. Because, as you see, if she'd arrived at London Airport, none of this would have happened. Unless, of course, someone had been sufficiently determined to prevent her. Really, you know, I can't go into that. I agreed to come here to give evidence of certain facts, but you must realize that both these ladies are my friends, and I hope that they will both remain so. Thank you, Sir Gerald. Yes, uh, 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 Sir Gerald, I, I think I'm right in saying that before you took up your present post, you were a member of the diplomatic service. Yes, my lord. Must have proved a most useful training ground. Now, can you tell us what sort of terms you're on at present with Miss Van Damme? Excellent terms, my lord. Well, I'm very fond of the opera myself. Uh, but it occurs to me that since this incident, we haven't had the pleasure of hearing Miss Van Damme sing at the London Opera House. Quite true, my lord. No suitable roles have been available. Hmm. Yes? I'm sorry, my lord. Sir Gerald, you said that uh, Miss Van Damme was in a tremendous temper, very tiresome. Do you consider that she was in a fit state to sing the demanding role of Carmen? I think she had a somewhat trying day. Yes, what interests me is whether she'd have been capable of carrying out her contract even if she'd arrived earlier. That's purely a hypothetical question, isn't it? Oh, no doubt it is, Sir Gerald, but I think, nevertheless, the jury would like to hear your expert opinion. Cheryl Van Damme is a superb artist who can delight her audience by her dramatic skill, even when her voice is not at its most brilliant. 
as it might not be after what you describe as an extremely trying day. One would have had to take all the factors into consideration. As I said, it was not a particularly musical audience, and it was Miss Van Damme they were expecting to see. Last-minute changes of cast always cause disappointment, however excellent the substitute. Did Miss Van Damme explain that she'd been locked in the ladies' toilet? No, but if she had, I doubt if I'd have gone out through the curtains and told the audience. Do you accept that she made every attempt to get to London, as she claimed? I see no reason to doubt her word. She told this court that after she'd hired a car to come to London, she was delayed by fog. But surely the fog was only at London Airport. Oh, no, I assure you it was everywhere, even in the auditorium of the Opera House. It was quite remarkable. Standing on the stage, one could scarcely see the gallery. And that might, too, have affected Miss Van Damme's voice, apparently already affected by fatigue and a great deal of shouting. Yes, I suppose that was an argument in favour of Miss Burns. I think it so shows the wisdom of my choice. How do you mean, exactly? Othello's constitution is remarkably robust. She jokes about it and says it's due to all those steaks and beer. There was no question of her damaging her voice. On the other hand, she'd be the first to admit that she isn't the greatest actress in the world. And there you see my difficulty in choosing between them. Van Damme always shows great artistry in her interpretations, while Burns makes a simply glorious noise. Now, mm. you... Uh spoke earlier of telephoning a colleague at the Frankfurt Opera House. Yes, Herr Brumeister. He mentioned the reception that Miss Van Damme had received there the previous evening? I think he did say something, yes. So here were you, Sir Gerald, already worried about the non-arrival of your star, and then this uh, Herr Brumeister, who apparently told you he'd seen her whistled off the stage the previous evening. Miss Van Damme has a somewhat unhappy relationship with Frankfurt. Well, no doubt you were worried when you heard about <coughs> these troubles. Why? Well, knowing Miss Van Damme, didn't you think these might affect her performance at your gala? I was more concerned with wondering where she was. Yes, but you yourself accused her of having a persecution mania. Who did she claim she was being persecuted by? The audience in Frankfurt? No. She seemed to think it was all my fault. Did she uh, make any accusations against Miss Burns? She spoke very bitterly about the way in which Othello had stepped into her place. Did she complain that Miss Burns had stolen her passport on the aeroplane and subsequently locked her into a public convenience? Not at that time, no. No. Of course, she might not have mentioned it because it hadn't yet occurred to her. Frankly, I simply wanted at that moment to be rid of her. There was royalty arriving at any moment, and I had Miss Burns to consider. I didn't want her upset just before her performance. Just now, you were telling us, Sir Gerald, how dependable Miss Burns was. Strong as an ox, you said. I was quoting her. Yes, yes, yes. But you regarded her as being remarkably robust. I merely wished to avoid a confrontation. She is very tough, you know, very determined. But do you really think that she is capable of the act alleged against her? That of going to these extreme lengths to prevent her rival from appearing on the stage? Frankly... I think both these ladies are capable of anything. I love them both dearly and I respect their talents without reservation, but they can be extremely disagreeable at times. The only difference between them is that Othello treats her career rather like some kind of sport, and though any setback causes her to be extremely bad tempered, she soon gets over it, like a cricketer who's missed a catch. Good on you, Jerry. <laughs> Miss Van Damme, how does she look on her career? <laughs> I wish I knew. Certainly not as a sport. More like a religion, really. Built around herself. Well, do you have any questions? More questions? Uh, yes, for the witness? yes, Lord. Um, Sir Gerald, you said that you thought either of these ladies to be capable of anything. May I follow the example of his lordship and ask you whether you think my client is capable of doing what is alleged against her? I'm not sure what you mean. My learned friend is suggesting that she missed the performance deliberately. Is that possible? I don't think so. Miss Van Damme is a great artist, but she's also extremely interested in money.
your name Frank Lionel Hollins? Yes. Do you live at 20 Cranmore Court, London West 1? I do. What is your occupation? I'm personal secretary to Miss Othella Burns. How long have you been in her employment? Since last October. Before that, I worked in the same capacity for Miss Cheryl Van Damme. Will you give us some idea of what your duties are? Arranging appointments, answering correspondence, booking travel facilities, hotel suites, that kind of thing. In October of last year, did you accompany Miss Van Damme on a visit to Frankfurt? Yes, I did. What would you uh, say was her disposition? I mean, uh, was she relaxed and at ease? No, she was very tense. She didn't like Frankfurt. She had the impression the audiences there were always against her. Was there any particular reason for that that you knew of? Yes, the previous season there'd been a row over a tenor she was rather keen on. She'd insisted on the Opera House employing him, although he really wasn't very good. By the end of the performance, he was greeted with a lot of whistles. Cheryl went to the footlights and called the audience a load of tone-deaf pigs. Didn't go down too well, as you can imagine. Nevertheless, she accepted another engagement there. Oh, yes. Cheryl would never refuse an offer, if the money was right. But she was rather scared. Were you, at that, were you present at that performance, Mr. Hollins? Yes, I was. Yes, now, you've said just now that she was scared. Did this affect her voice at all? No, not in the first three acts. The audience was treating her quite politely. Although there was a great deal more applause for the girl singing Aida, a relatively unknown girl. By the end of the Nile scene, Cheryl went forward and was practically dead silence. I went round to her dressing room in the interval and found her screaming at her dresser. Why? No one else to scream at, I suppose, till I got there. What happened after that? In Act 4, she was distinctly flat. And, of course, Aida got better and better, encouraged by the applause she was getting. By the end, they took separate curtain calls and... Cheryl received a lot of whistles and foot stamping. I was really quite sorry for her. After the uh, performance, did you have any conversation with her? Yes, we went straight back to the hotel. I asked her if she wanted anything to eat. She said no. She was going off to bed with a sleeping pill, wishing to God she didn't have to go to London the next day. On the following morning, how did she seem then? She was very irritable, ready to find fault. By the time we got on the aircraft, she wanted a drink, took a long time to come, so she started snapping at the steward. Then Miss Burns turned up, which didn't make things better by telling a few home truths about the previous night's performance. Now, did Miss Van Damme usually drink when she had a performance in the evening? No, I hardly ever saw her touch anything, except perhaps a glass of port before she went on stage. You say a glass of port? Yes, my lord, a lot of singers do that. They gargle with it, then they spit it out. Yeah. Now, uh, come to the matter of Miss Van Damme's passport. When was the last occasion on which you saw it? At the barrier in Frankfurt. I handed mine and hers to the official, and then in the departure lounge I gave Cheryl hers back. She put it in her handbag. Why was that? Because I knew at London we'd have to go through separate barriers. Yes, in fact, as we have heard, the plane was diverted to Fulchester, where Miss Van Damme's passport could not be found. Mr. Hollins... Did you take her passport? Certainly not. Did you see anyone else take it? No. If uh, Miss Van Damme had want to, wanted to take it out without you noticing it, would she have been able to do so? Yes, certainly. I didn't watch her like a hawk all the time. Now, Mr Hollins, we come to the next incident on this singularly ill-fated journey when Miss Van Damme entered the ladies' toilet. Oh, really, Mr O'Connor? You're not going to suggest the witness was physically present, are you? No, my lord. I was going to ask the witness whether he'd seen Miss Van Damme on her way to the toilet. Oh, do let's get on. Mr. Hollins? I was on the platform waiting for the train. Cheryl came storming through the ticket barrier, ran straight past me without saying a word. What sort of a state was she in? I thought she looked absolutely demented. I had this extraordinary feeling she was looking for somewhere to hide. Perhaps she was, Mr. Hollins. Are you suggesting, Mr. Hollins, that this internationally renowned operatic star was seeking some form of sanctuary in a public laboratory? Well, of course, I can't be certain, but what it What do you think she was running away from? From the responsibility of singing in that night's gala when she knew her voice was in pretty awful shape. Well, if you thought that she was in such a distressed condition, why didn't you do something about it? You were still, presumably, at this moment, in her employment? I didn't think I was. Oh, had you been formally discharged, then? 
She had just stood up in an airport crowded with people and called me a dumb bastard and told me to get lost. I took that to mean she didn't want me anymore. Ah, but fortunately, Miss Burns was at hand to take you on. Or had that been arranged before? It certainly had not. Had you and Miss Burns not already decided to prevent Miss Van Damme from appearing in that performance? That's perfectly ridiculous. Well, it's rather a coincidence, isn't it, that you should have transferred your allegiance from the plaintiff to the defendant at the precise moment all these events occurred. Miss Burns not only took Miss Van Damme's place in the opera, she took her secretary as well. We didn't cook it up together, if that's what you mean. Mm. When Miss Van Damme was detained at the airport, did she ask you to make a telephone call on her behalf? Yes, she did. She asked me to phone Sir Gerald Pegler. Yes. And why didn't you do so? There was a long queue waiting. By the time oh. it was my turn, all I got was a recorded voice saying all the lines to London were engaged. But couldn't you have tried again later from the station, for instance? Yes, I suppose I could have done. Yes. But by then, Van Damme had publicly insulted me. I wasn't in the mood for doing her any favours, I can tell you. I see. Do you wish to re-examine, Mr. Ravonna? No, my lord. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Who's your next witness? The defendant, my lord, Mr. Fella Burns. We'll call the defendant. I'd like to go into the witness box now, please, Mr. Burns. What is your religion? Presbyterian. Take the Bible in your right hand and read aloud the words on this card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Is your name Othella Maud Macmillan Burns? It is. And do you live at Cranmore Court, London West 1? That's my UK base, yes, but I don't spend as much time in it as I would like. What is your occupation, please, Miss Burns? I think I may say I am one of the world's leading operatic sopranos. Where were you, Miss Burns, on the evening of the 19th of October of last year? Was that the Saturday? Yes. Uh, then I was in Frankfurt, Germany. I'd been doing some recording there, and I decided to stay over a couple of days and hear Miss Van Damme and Aida. Did you regard Miss Van Damme as a friend of yours? We'd been colleagues for many years. What happened to this performance? Well, I didn't think she was quite as bad as the critics said. We all have our off nights. I thought I might go backstage and comfort her, but what could I say? I always believe in being frank. Why should Miss Van Damme need comforting? Poor thing, she'd been whistled at. I see. And um, when did you next meet? Next morning on what was supposed to be the London plane. Well, I thought I ought to say something to her. I didn't want her to think that everybody was against her, so I said, hello there, Cheryl. What did she say? She invited me to sit beside her. Now, are you quite sure of that? Positive. She was with Mr. Hollands. They were trying to get a drink. She asked me what I'd like. Then she took a mink coat from the seat beside her to let me sit there. Did you say anything about having seen her performance the previous night? I said I'd seen it. But I certainly didn't pass any remark about the fact that she sang flat. I have too much respect for the sensitivity of my fellow artists, particularly Miss Van Damme. What do you mean by that? It's well known that the least little thing will put her off, like being whistled at, for instance. Me, I take it in my stride. Not that I have any personal experience. Did Miss Van Damme say why she was flying to London? Yes, she told me about the gala and I thought, you poor thing, having to sing just 24 hours after that big flop in Frankfurt and then to put the lid on it, there was this announcement about the plane not being able to land in London on account of the fog. Yes, how did Miss Van Damme take this news? Oh, well, she became practically hysterical. She got up and went off to find the captain as if he could do anything. Frank went after her, trying to cool her down. Now, at that point... Do you remember where Miss Van Damme's handbag was? No, I haven't the faintest idea. It was probably on the floor. She had a whole lot of stuff. Jewel cases, the mink coat. No, I have no idea where the handbag was. Now, I must ask you this, Miss Burns. Did you, at this point, open Miss Van Damme's handbag and take anything from it? Her passport, for example. No, I certainly did not. I mean, her passport wasn't of the slightest interest to me. 
The only thing that did concern me was her state of mind. I thought, poor soul, having to sing Carmen after yelling and screaming like that and ruining her voice. What happened when the plane landed at Fulchester Airport? Oh, Frank and I went through one barrier and Cheryl, being an American, went through the other. After I'd shown them my passport, I went off to see when the next train to London was. No one was too sure on account of the fog. And then suddenly I heard a hell of a commotion and Cheryl shouting that she couldn't find her passport. Yes, now, did she say anything about what might have happened to it? No, she was just going through all her cabin baggage, trying to find the thing. I'd have helped her, but they wouldn't let me back. Then she shouted to Frank that he should telephone the Opera House or the American Embassy or someone, so he went off to find a phone and then came back to say he couldn't get through to London. Yes, what was Miss Van Damme's reaction to this? She called him a dumb bastard. She can be very cruel sometimes. Oh, Frank was definitely hurt. Was that all she said? No. She told him to get lost. What happened next, please? Well... I went and waited for my luggage, but by the time it came up, there was still no sign of Cheryl, so Frank and I decided to take a taxi to the station. When we got there, we were told the next train to London would be in about an hour, so we had a cup of tea and sat around, and then I went to the ladies' toilet, which was in a terrible condition. So I decided just to wash my hands and wait till the train came in. Yes, now, when you say in a terrible condition... Well, practically everything was out of order. I mean, you'd think at least there'd be clean towels, but no, I had to send the attendant off to find one. Yes, now while she was doing that, did someone else come in? Too right. The Pittsburgh Nightingale in person, Miss Van Dam. Did she uh, say anything to you? Oh, she was in such a rage she could hardly speak. Anyway, I had my back to her. I was doing my face. Then the attendant came back, without the towel, naturally, and she told La Van Dam that the lock was out of order. What happened then? Well, I turned around just in time to see Cheryl going into one of the cubicles and slam the door, and I thought, the best of luck, dear. Personally, I couldn't wait to get out of the place. So I joined Frank on the platform to wait for the train. And then a fellow put up a placard to say the next train was for London. So I said to him, where will the first-class carriages stop? And we moved along a bit to where he said the train came in, and we got on it. Now, was there any indication at that point of what had happened to Miss Van Dam? Hmm? I mean, uh, did you realise that she perhaps had been detained? Locked in, you mean? Honestly, if I had thought that, I'd have considered she'd brought it on herself. I mean, I heard the woman say it was out of order. What did you think had happened to her, then? Well, there were a whole lot of people on the platform, and she could have gone on at the end of the train and stayed there to avoid me and Frank. It wasn't until we got to London that we realised she wasn't on the train at all. What did you do, then, Miss Burns? Well, I thought, my God, someone had, let a bit the, someone had better let the opera house know. So Frank and I went around to my flat in a taxi and we telephoned from there. By this time they were very worried. I mean, they had no idea where Cheryl was and they hadn't been able to begin the run-through. Well, I thought, I can help them out. I've done this particular production and I can stand in for her until she arrives. What happened uh, after the walk-through? I've got a big round of applause from the orchestra and the other members of the cast. <laughs> no. I'm sorry, I mean, was there any discussion as to uh, what should happen as regards the performance? Oh, there certainly was. The conductor said that even if Cheryl oh, did my Lord, arrive, what the conductor the... said is hardly evidence. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that he's in Buenos Aires and cannot... Yes, quite so, with... Mr. Harvester. Yes, Mr. O'Connor. Having uh, taken part in the rehearsal, what did you do next? I went into a dressing room and did my exercises, then I sent out for a big fried steak and a can of beer. So whom, be, whom did you send out? Frank Hollins. Had you by then engaged him as your secretary? No, he was just making himself useful. Oh, it was then Sir Gerald came in looking very worried because he still had no word from Cheryl. So I said, you'd better drink the beer and I'll go on and do Carmen for you. There was still an hour before the performance, so I lay down and had a sleep. Was the uh, performance a success? Well, the audience seemed to enjoy it. And afterwards, uh, did you have any visitors? No, I told the doorman not to let anybody in. I was changing. You see, there was a reception at the French Embassy. Yes, in particular, did Miss Van Damme make any attempt to see you? No, she didn't. Neither before nor after the performance. I think she could have sent a bunch of flowers. I mean, in my opinion, I'd done her a good turn, but instead of a bunch of flowers, all I've got is this darned writ. 
Now, one of the allegations against you is that of false imprisonment. You mean where I'm supposed to have locked her in the toilet? Do you think it could have been an accident? No, I don't. I think she knew she was in for a big flop and she was in a blue funk about it and she wanted an excuse to miss the train but being Cheryl she also wants the $12,000 so she's trying to blame it on me. Thank you, Miss Burns. Miss Burns. In the operatic world you're sometimes known as La Meravigliosa, the marvellous one. That's right. Mm. But I am not known as the boxing kangaroo. She made that one up. And Miss Van Dam has been called the Pittsburgh Nightingale. Now, no one disputes that you're both extremely talented. World-class champions, in fact. But as a result, you've always been rivals, haven't you? You could say that. Yes. And on occasion, this rivalry has erupted into what might almost be called open warfare. Oh, look, if there ever have been ructions, it was Cheryl who started them. I'm a very placid person. It takes a lot to get me going. But what she said to the press about the Sydney Opera House was unforgivable. Oh, really? What did she say about the Sydney Opera House? She said it was only fit for cattle shows and she'd no doubt I'd be appearing there. I see. And what was your reply? said you'd better not try and buy a ticket. They'd probably take her for a bloody abo. And where did this exchange of civilities take place? In Paris. At the Congress for Cultural Cooperation. And you weren't exactly bosom friends. So why were you so keen to sit next to her on the plane? I wasn't all that keen. She invited me. And may I say, I thought it very strange that she was stuck into a rum and coke considering it was practically breakfast time and she had a performance to do that evening. Did you have a drink? I had a lime juice. Was that because you'd already decided to take her place? Hmm? Look, as Were far you already, so to speak, in training? As far as I was concerned, we were going straight to London. What I might have done to Cheryl, supposing I'd wanted to, wouldn't have stopped her from appearing at the Opera House. What are you trying to do? Blame the fog on me as well? No, no, no. no. But when the announcement was made that the plane was being diverted to Fulchester and Miss Van Dam went forward to the galley with Mr. Hollins following, you saw her handbag with the passport in it and seized your opportunity, didn't you? Oh, how on earth would I know where her passport was? She was carrying a whole lot of junk. I mean, it could have been anywhere. But it disappeared. And you were the only person with both motive and opportunity for taking it. Apart from her, as I've already said, she wanted an opportunity to miss the gala and this was the way she reckoned she could manage it. Well, whoever devised the scheme, it didn't work. Miss Van Damme was eventually allowed to leave the airport, passport or no passport. And I suggest that when you saw her arrive at Fulchester Station, you decided on a more energetic course of action. Now, listen, my friend. I have been an international star for 15 years and I don't have to resort to locking other prima donnas in the toilet. Furthermore, Van Damme's voice is quite loud enough for everyone to have heard she was in trouble. She could have screamed so loud that the engine driver would have wondered what the hell was going on. When the train came in, you and Mr. Hollins got onto it without giving a single thought to what had happened to Miss Van Damme. Well, why should we? We were only interested in getting to London. Yes, precisely, so that you could take her place. Look, she could have been on the back of the train in the guard's van. We didn't know she wasn't on it until we got to London. And then you immediately telephoned the Opera House and offered yourself as a substitute. For the walkthrough, yes. But you already had it in mind to do the performance as well, hadn't you? For all I knew, Cheryl could have taken another 20 trains. She could have hired a car, chartered an aeroplane. London Airport was still closed by fog. Look, if Cheryl had really wanted to do that performance in London, she'd have flown in on a broomstick. You don't know what that woman would do for $12,000 if she thought she could deliver the goods, but she knew she couldn't. She'd had a lousy night in Frankfurt. She'd been practically hysterical all morning and she'd had one rum and coke too many. Why didn't you tell Sir Gerald that you'd last seen Miss Van Damme in a public convenience in Fulchester? There are some things a lady doesn't discuss. No. You prefer to let him think that she was still delayed at the airport. I didn't deliberately lie about it, and whilst we're on the subject, 
I wouldn't believe a word that woman says. Not only has she brought me into court and lied about me, but according to the press, she apparently thinks she's 32. <laughs> now, it may seem a small thing, but I've always believed that anyone who lies about a small thing will lie about a big one, too. Now, how did you discover that Miss Van Damme isn't 32? By looking in her passport? I've never seen her passport in all my life. <laughs> Have you any more questions for your client, Mr. O'Connor? Uh, yes, my lord, just mm -hmm. one. Miss Burns, on what do you base your estimate of Miss Van Damme's true age? I have a large collection of old opera programs. She was a promising 16-year-old in 1949. Now work it out for yourselves. It's a lie! Madam Butterfly. I was eight years old and I was playing the baby! You must have been a hell of a surprise to Lieutenant Pinkerton. Ladies, please. Now. I think I can say that you have both given me tremendous pleasure in the past, but not now, when your voices are raised in anger. Have you any further questions, Mr. O'Connor? No, my lord. <laughs> then you may leave the witness box, Miss Burns. And now, members of the jury, false imprisonment is what we lawyers call a tort, a civil wrong, and someone who's falsely imprisoned may bring an action for damages against the person responsible. Well, a person can be falsely imprisoned without actually being shut up, incarcerated in a prison cell or tired of London. It is enough if a person in any manner is wrongly deprived of his or her liberty. Now here the plaintiff claims that she was in a sense incarcerated, not in a prison cell, but in a public lavatory. And she claims that the defendant was responsible. Her case is that Miss Burns overheard Mrs. Bullet, the lavatory attendant, say that if the door was shut, it might become stuck. And that having heard that, she deliberately slammed the door shut, with the result that it did become stuck, and the plaintiff thereby was imprisoned. Not for long, not for many minutes, but for long enough to miss the train. Now, if you think that is what happened, then this was indeed the wrong of false imprisonment, because no one including the defendant, could possibly justify such a detention of the plaintiff. Now, the defendant denies all this. She says she went to that walkthrough at the Opera House merely to help Sir Gerald Pegler, and with no intention of replacing Miss Van Damme. Further, she claims that Miss Van Damme deliberately missed that performance. Now, if you do find for the plaintiff, Miss Van Damme, you must then go on to consider the question of damages. Now, it is already agreed, if you find for her, that she should receive the sterling equivalent of the $12,000 fee which she missed. You needn't concern yourselves with that. What you have to consider is whether she is entitled to any further compensation for the very event of being locked up in the lavatory, the associated distress, the loss of an opportunity further to enhance her professional reputation at the performance she missed. Now, such compensation would be called general damages, and what you have to consider is whether she is entitled to such a sum, and if so, how much. Now, lastly, I have to remind you that the burden of establishing her case lies on the plaintiff, Miss Van Damme. Uh, she must satisfy you of the essential elements of her claim on the balance of probabilities. In other words, she must satisfy you that it is more probable than not that her allegations are true before you can find for her, and if she doesn't so satisfy you, then you must find for the defendant, Miss Burns. Will you now please retire, elect a foreman, and consider your verdict? Members of the jury, will your foreman please stand? Just answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict upon which you are all agreed? Yes. Do you find for the plaintiff or the defendant? The defendant. 